Well, good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys. Bonsoir and bienvenue. My name is Riley Brockington, the proud city councillor for River Ward and trustee with the Ottawa Public Library Board. And I'm thrilled to join you this evening. Before we begin, it is important to acknowledge that even as we gather virtually, we are on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe First Peoples. I would like to thank our partners, the Ottawa International Writers Festival and Library and Archives Canada for their collaboration on these wonderful author events. At the Ottawa Public Library, we are big fans of Lev Grossman and the Magicians Trilogy, so we're extremely excited to welcome him to our virtual stage to, to discuss his latest novel, The Silver Arrow. A thrilling fantasy adventure is exactly what young and young at heart readers need right now, so I can't wait to hear more about it this evening. I also invite you to visit the Ottawa Public Library website to find out about other upcoming programs and events, to check the OPL's online resources and to find your next read. And don't forget that as of August the 17th, most Ottawa Public Library branches have opened to the public, including an abbreviated version of the Bookmobile. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Sean Wilson from the Ottawa International Writers Festival to say a few words. Thank you and have a great evening. Merci et bonne soirée. Thank you so much, Councillor, and thank you all for being with us this evening. Uh, our virtual season has been um, uh, off to a great start. It continues, uh, believe it or not, right up until the end of November. We've got live events every week, video events every Sunday podcast dropping Fridays, and now we're going to be doing some midweek podcasts as well. You can get all the information on that at writersfestival.org. And as I look at this remarkably beautiful book, um, I'm reminded that the greatest way to say thank you to an author is to buy like 17 copies of the book and to give it to all the young people in your life. Um, our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street, but wherever you are on planet Earth, there is an independent bookseller somewhere nearby, and they are good people, uh, and they will sell you this book and uh, they will be very happy to sell you this book. And so please get out there and buy it. Um, thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, our host this evening <clears throat> is the amazing Alan Neal from CBC Radio 191.5 on All in a Day, uh, uh, weekdays between three and 6 p.m. Uh, we had a great uh, early chat with Lev this afternoon on the show uh, where Alan brought in some of the kids from, from their uh, All in a Day summer, um, or sorry, March break camp. And uh, we are in fantastic hands. So let's give a warm, Virtual welcome to our host for the evening, CBC's Alan Neal. Alan? Thank you so much, Sean, and thanks to everybody for having me here. I'm not joining you from my home in case you uh, were concerned about my decorating skills, as I am still at work for you people. This, not only do I get a haircut for you people, I even stay at work longer for you people. I guess I could have angled the camera so it didn't show the plugs behind me. But anyway, that is the glory of radio on television. Uh, but so thrilled to be here talking about this book because uh, this was a, such a joy to read. Uh, at one point in Lev Grossman's book, The Silver Arrow, one of the two protagonists, kids who have been given the very practical gift of a magical train that picks up animals, because who doesn't want an 11 year old driving a train full of animals, uh, tells the story so far where he says, we went through the woods and we didn't crash and then we saw a station and it was full of animals and they talked and then the train talked, which is kind of a plot summary, really. But the, the magic of the Silver Arrow is partially in the mystery of why those kids and all those animals ended up on the train and the journey that they all go through and, and learn along the way. And the guy who created them is, of course, no stranger to magic. Lev Grossman, New York Times bestselling author of the Magician series. Uh, and so it's maybe not a surprise at one point when Kate says at, near the beginning of the book, why should I pay attention to real life? Real life is boring. And her uncle, the guy who gives her the train, asks, how do you know it's boring if you don't pay attention to it? And Kate replies, well, maybe real life should pay attention to me sometimes. And that is just one example of how Lev Grossman takes a you know, supposedly fantasy book to get at very real issues, including not only what it's like to be a 11 year old and struggling to find your own voice in your place, but the minor detail of saving the species on the planet species that Kate will find herself talking to in the book, like a heron and a porcupine and a mamba snake and a fishing cat, all slowly turning to her and the train to do something about the state of the planet. And the fishing cat tells her at one point, a good human being 
imagine what one of those could do. Uh, this is a book well worth reading, well worth discussing. And I, if you've got questions for Lev Grossman yourself, there's going to be a question period at the end. If you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tool, which I am learning how to use right now to ask your question on Zoom, or you can leave a comment on Facebook and we will, I will do my very best to get the, that question to Lev as well. Um, but there are, of course, big statements throughout this book to, to be talking about, um, including at one point a mamba who explains to Kate why he's not eating, saying, I swallowed a wild gerbil a few days ago. I'm still digesting. Besides, the sight of a mamba feeding is too awe-inspiring for most animals to watch. I say this because I know you're glad you tuned in right around dinner time. I'm thrilled to say Lev Grossman is joining us from his much better decorated home. Hello there, Lev. Hello. Hi, Alan. Um, perhaps we can start with the, the eating moment. Had you seen a mamba eat before? Well, I never have, and I, I hope that I never will. <laughs> I hope that I never will. It would truly be an awe-inspiring sight um, <laughs> to witness, except if it were eating you, for example. <laughs> yeah, um, you don't want to be the... the, the no, the, no, barely be, being bitten by a mamba. Uh, mamba venom is just so painful and unpleasant in so many different ways, like the list of symptoms that it will provoke in you, just, it goes on and on. And it's funny, I actually thought about leaving it out, like, oh, is this too much? Um, you know, is it too real? Um, but then I thought, oh, it's so fascinating. Um, doesn't everybody <laughs> want to know what happens when you get bitten by one of the most venomous snakes in the world? So I left it in. Now, were you, were you like a, just using the mamba as an example, were you like a fan of mambas ahead of time before this book? In which case, what all are you keeping in that other rooms in the house? But but is <laughs> were you like passionate about that kind of animal science? Prior? Well, I I I always um uh, uh I always thought mambas had the coolest name of any snake. Yes. Um, uh, and then uh, but it was only when I was writing the book when I that I really kind of delved into the lore around the mamba, which is a much misunderstood snake. They're actually quite shy and retiring. Um, if they're biting you, you probably deserve it um, because you really have to get one mad before it'll do it. Um, but they're fascinating. They're, they're extremely long and incredibly fast in case you weren't worried enough about the mamba um, with its bite alone. They are one of the fastest snakes on land. Um, yeah. So you can't run. <laughs> was that i mean when when you're choosing the species for obviously you had to choose species that were a little bit at risk or having hard times these days for in order to to make the the sort of purpose of the book make sense but were you very selective in in choosing which animals you were letting on the on the train i almost said well, it was so hard to decide i mean one of the things about the book um i love talking animals i always love them in books but they tend not to be very exotic or very specific i mean yeah. uh, you know you tend to get you get a bird or maybe it's a you know it's a sparrow or um or it's a bunny but what kind of bunny you never find out i thought well if it were an animal it'd be very important to you what kind of animal you are um so i decided to get very specific um and of course the thing about animals is the closer you look at them uh, the uh, the more fascinating um they get so it was hard to decide ultimately which ones were going to make it in um uh, and there are a lot, I, I, it was painful for me to, to leave out. And like the fishing cat, for instance, which I have to admit not being incredibly aware of, that there's this fantastic moment where Kate comes into one of the cars of the, the train and she sees this cat and says, for a second, I thought you were a pillow. And the cat says, for a second, I thought you were a large defenseless rodent. Which <laughs> 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 was just this fantastic introductory. It's kind of like a Lauren Bacall turn. <laughs> But but what the fishing cat? Where did this spring from for you? You know, I I was um, my wife is Australian and uh, we spend a certain amount of time there. And there's a great zoo in Sydney, and I was walking past the enclosure um, of the fishing cat. They have a fishing cat there. Um, mm -hmm. And fishing cats, they are they are cats. Not not they're not as big as a lion, but they're larger than a house cat. Um, and they swim and they dive for their prey, and I just found this so profoundly unexpected uh, that there is a cat that likes to swim uh, uh, and swims by choice. I just, I was so blown away by that, um, that when I started to write a book about animals, I knew, I knew that there had to be a fishing cat in it um, because that cat would have a lot to say. It's interesting though, because that line about, well, first of all, the, the mamba talking about eating the gerbil and then the cat 
telling her I thought you were a defenseless rodent. It did sort of <laughs> trigger in my mind. What if they all eat each other on the trail? <laughs> what if what if all these species start wandering down the hall and just like start chowing down on on each other? That doesn't happen for anybody <laughs> tuning in and thinking, oh my gosh, I do not want to do this. I th- read this book. Um, th- that does not happen. But was that ever in your mind? Like how? Should I have one of the animals eat another of the animals? Yes, I know. Why not, why not let nature take its course? <laughs> <laughs> but there seems to be a kind of, you know, uh, universal tr- truth on the tra- uh, truce on the train. Um, yes. The animals, they do not go after each other. I can't actually wonder at one point if they all went after each other, which one would win? <laughs> Um, because of course yeah. your mind would go there. Um, and she's betting on the porcupine, which I think is a pretty safe bet. Um, you don't get a lot of animals who can take down a porcupine at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but yes, everyone's, they snipe at each other verbally, um, but mm-hmm. no blood is actually drawn. <laughs> but you, I mean, there, there is, because I mean, thankfully, for instance, in, in Disney, we don't see the, the mouse get taken down by any of its its natural predators either but it's but it is in in terms of how realistic to go with the animals given as that they are talking and chatting and about each other all, all the time was it a bit of a wrestling act to figure out how how realistic to go with, with the portrayal of what an animal can do considering he's also talking and on a train yes well uh, it was definitely important to me to kind of embody the animal I, I wanted to think you know this isn't like a I didn't want it to be like a cartoon where it's a human being just voicing an animal I wanted to feel like what would it actually feel like to be a heron uh, or a snake you'd be very conscious if you were a snake I don't have any limbs <laughs> or as it turns out any eyelids I don't have eyelids um, or really any ears um, they would just feel they would feel very different and uh and I think the mom is also very self-conscious about its venom. He feels very proud that he is incredibly mm-hmm. deadly. Um, but at the same time, um, he knows that everybody looks at him kind of like, uh, uh, okay, I no, no, uh, you know, you're venomous and I'm just going to keep my distance from you, you know, which I think right. he's a kindly soul at heart and, and he feels a little bit bad about his venomousness. It's a, it's an inner conflict that I guess Mambas probably have. It's interesting that you used the term embody the animals because I tried to picture Lev Grossman like when you were writing this were, did you were you like acting out the animals at home at all or is where you're sitting there kind of thinking how, how would I get around to I and but I have to just like were you were you trying to get because I, I mean an author gets into the heads of the characters right like I know I know I do a lot of very hammy acting when I'm writing which you know thank goodness there's never there's no video evidence of this and it, well never... we actually do have video evidence. no I'm just kidding no. <laughs> um uh uh yeah probably you know there probably was um a little bit of that just a little just a little but you there's that physical this i mean it's something that's missing when you're a writer because it's not dance and it's not acting you don't have that physicality yeah. so you really want to make sure it's it's there in the words um yeah i did my best with it um th white who wrote the uh, uh sword in the stone is just so brilliant at that and i i sort of would go back to him and Think about how he did it. He he. Uh, uh, in, at one point in that book, the young King Arthur is turned into an owl, and he eats a mouse. Um, and T. H. White describes it as it um, being a little bit like a peach, you know, fuzzy on the outside, but then delicious inside. And I remember reading that as a child and be like, "That is what it would be like." It seemed like <laughs> such an important lesson as a writer. So I've always tried to follow that that school of um, talking animal writing. When did you read first read Sword in the Stone? Oh, I've read it so many times. I probably read it when I was, what, seventh grade? When do you read uh, uh, A Sword in the Stone? Probably, I was probably 12 or 13. Um, it's probably the book that I've reread the most times of any book that I own. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Why, why do you think you go back to that one? Don't worry, we're going back to your one in a minute, but I just, uh, while we're there, I, I wondered why. We talk about me. And yeah, then... I know more about uh, Lev. Yeah. Uh, um, it, well, because it is... Um, it has that wonderful way that it makes magic feel very real. Uh, mm-hmm. The way he describes magic, especially in the early books uh, where Merlin is is is, is teaching um, the young King Arthur. Um, uh, Merlin, is, he's always casting spells, but they feel very real. You know, they're not um, they're not you know Gandalf. They're sort of crazy and 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 world ending. Um, they just feel very like they're he's in the same room with you. He describes it in this very physical way, uh, and. Um, 
made a big impression on me. It's something I was just always aspiring to because, of course, there's a lot of cliches around magic. Now, I don't know if Lev has frozen for everyone or if it's just for me. I'm going to just give it a moment here. has frozen for everyone. Whoop. I think Lev is going to get back on the line momentarily. So once again, if you're just tuning in right now and thinking, gee, I hope this isn't going to be just Alan talking, uh, it won't be. Lev Grossman, I'm presuming, is going to get back on the line very shortly. Uh, but you are listening to the special presentation of Writers Fest and the Ottawa Public Library. And we're talking about the Silver Arrow, which I realize I think when I hold it up is actually backwards. So it's not the Revless Wara by Nam Sorg Vel. It is in fact, The Silver Arrow by Lev Grossman. Uh, and I will use this stalling technique of letting you know that Lev was on our show uh, all in a day, a little bit earlier today, talking about the book with two of our all in a day March break campers who uh, were in fact um, read the book for us. So I wanna say a big thank you to Daniel and Sam as well. Um, and you can check out that interview at cbc.ca slash all in a day, uh, where we've got the audio posted of that conversation. And among the things that they brought up, in fact, was uh, the voice of the narrator in the book, Kate, who uh, at 11 years old, I think it's a pretty remarkable thing to hear how Lev actually ended up creating um, that voice and nailing it so perfectly in the course over the course of um, the, the book itself. I perhaps will find myself reading perhaps the entire book. Oh, except I think Lev Grossman has reconnecting with us now. Lev, <laughs> you're back. I'm back. I don't know what, um, that's never happened to me before. I answered, <laughs> I answered all the questions in the meantime. Thank goodness. So, I, so you know, I was hoping you would. Um, just your greatest inspiration, yeah. your favorite family member, it's all been taken <laughs> care of. Uh, welcome back. So you were talking about magic, though, and this uh, idea of the, this weird thing of of which path you can take as when writing magic. Well, the great challenge when you're writing about magic and think other things that aren't real is to make them feel real. Um, and you know, uh, T. H. White was a big master of that. C. S. Lewis, the Narnia books, and the, you know what they always did was try to describe it in terms of things that are real, um, hmm. and not use big words like, you know, mystical and enchanted and, you know, glittery yeah. and things like that, um, make it feel really real and immediate. Um, it's, it's, it's what I aspire to. It, it, that's interesting. Like, how much do you find you have to understand the magic to write about it? Like, do you have to have sort of the set rules? And I ask this because, in fact, one of the kids on, on the show today, I know was, was sort of intrigued with where the magic, the roots of where this magic for the magic train came from. And Part of the wondrous thing about magic is the mystery, right? So I just wonder yeah. when you're crafting it, do you, do you, even if you don't put it all in, in words in here, do mm. you, do you know the rules of the magic? Well, that's the paradox about magic is that it can't be just like anything can happen. It has to be, it has, there has to be rules. And yet if there are too many rules, it stops being magical. Um, and then it's just like, oh, that's science. That's not magic at all. Um, so uh, uh, it has to be, a, you, have, you have to re retain that increment of mystery to make it feel as though it's, it's truly um, supernatural. So I make it a point of understanding about 92% of it, and then the other 8% is just, you know, unknowable. Is that, in terms of, of writing things out, I mean, are you writing out the rules of magic ahead of time before you even delve into the book, or is it kind of making it up as you go along? I think it, I would probably lean toward the second one. Right. Um, I mean, the, all, the, the, the number one rule of writing with magic is you can't have magic be so powerful that it solves the problems that are the plot of the book. Right. You have to make sure that they can't just wave a wand and say, oh, by the way, we can actually fix climate change. Um, I just got a spell for that. Well, oh, it's right here. Uh, you, 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 you have to um, you know, make sure that there are constraints um, in the system. It's the, um, among the, you do tackle, of course, climate change in the book and the, the question of what, how these kids are sort of 
pledged with the idea of, of needing to get these animals to safety. And that's a big responsibility to be asking of, of an 11 year old at, at, at any point. And I wondered how you rest, how much you wrestled with that idea of saying to kids, Hey, you can make a difference versus, and it's all on you to save the planet. <laughs> the, that, 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 um, sort of two sides of, of that one question. Cause yeah. Kate could in theory be feeling she does feel the pressure in this book of, of helping all the animals. I, it was very, I didn't, uh, it was very important to me that this book not be, it's not a political argument about climate change. First and foremost, it is a story about yeah. uh, people that are meant to feel real and also some non-humans who are also meant to feel real. Um, but in a funny way, you can't quite get away from it. Um, I mean, when you think of Narnia and the Pevensies go into Narnia, they meet Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are very glad to see them and they have a nice chat and they go to tea and then the Pevensies save the world. It's a very different story now. Now, if you're talking to an animal, very much has changed. Our relationship with nature and, and the natural world has changed so much. So now if you were to meet a beaver or a mamba, um, the conversation would go very differently. The, the mamba would probably have a lot to say to you about um, what's going on in the world. And when you meet them, they wouldn't see you as, some, as, the, as the hero. They don't see you as the person who's come to save the world. They see you as part of that species that's kind of fouled everything up. Yeah. Uh, you're so, Kate has this funny thing of being, she's the hero of the story, but in some ways she's the villain as well. And she needs to kind of take that into herself and kind of process it. And that comes out of not because I want to make a political argument, because I watch, it's because I watch my children um, becoming increasingly aware of it. They, they learn, the more they learn about the natural world, and as all kids are, they're fascinated with animals. They are having to cope with something that no generation has ever had to cope with before that. They are becoming, they are growing up fully conscious of the debt that the previous generations have incurred and it's gonna um, fall on them to, to repay it. And they find it so challenging that I felt they should have a story about it. And that is really where the book came from or much of where it came from. It's interesting because there was an article I found from five, I guess five years ago now, where you were talking about your daughter who was 11 at the time and you were kind of mortified that she had read the Magicians series <laughs> at that point. And you said, you know, I kind of wish she'd waited until she was 35, given all, all the content in. And I thought, wait a sec, he's got another 11 year, almost 11 year old daughter now. Is this, is this the chance to like right that wrong? Where you're saying, okay, <laughs> this time around, <laughs> I'm gonna make a story that's, that's for her. Um, had she expressed a lot of those concerns about the planet? <sighs> Yeah, yeah, to, to the extent that, that, that she's sort of able to. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's not that she's precocious. You, kids can't get away from it, you know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's all around them. Uh, the 11-year-old who's now 16, um, uh, she was the one who urged me to write this book. Now that she's 16, she's too cool to read it. Um, so it's, that was all wasted, but I do have another rising 11 year old who's now squarely in the zone and a seven year old who's coming up. So, um, uh, there's, you know, there's still hope. The 11 year old that's coming up though. Have you barred her from the magicians now? Have you learned your lesson from the last one where you're like, okay, now this time around, I'm going to hide those books from her and she will never read them. Alan, I have learned my lesson. <laughs> I've learned it. Uh, I mean, the mistake I made was leaving them around because I have about 100 copies of them and saying, but say, you're never, ever allowed to read this book. If you leave 100 copies of someone and then of a book around and then forbid your child to read them, there is no book in your library that they will, you know, that they will more want to read. Um, I'm trying to play it a little bit cooler now, but uh, yeah. it's okay. definitely off limits. It's, it reminds me, in fact, of the book. The, the kids create a mystery car at one point. Like, that's just, they, they say, create a car that's part of the train that we won't even know what's inside of it. And it's got that great kind of, like, checkoff feel. Like, you know, the gun is in the, it's going <laughs> to have to go off at some At some point, we're going to need to figure out what's right. in the mystery train. Did you know from the get, don't reveal what's in the mystery train. Don't give it away now. <laughs> but did you know from the get-go uh, this is, I, I know what I, what's in that mystery train. I knew, I, I, okay. I knew it was in there. 
the very first thing I thought was it would be cool to have a mystery car in their own train that they don't know what's in it. I mean, the great thing about tr about a train, right, for a storyteller is it's uh, you're in the train, it's moving, and it's, you're exploring the world in this train. But the train is itself kind of a world that you can go into um, and sort of explore. Um, so there's a world inside and a world outside, and I knew that there had to be a mystery inside as well as outside. Um, uh, and so I created a mystery car. And at a certain point in the book, I'm hoping every will have, but everybody will have forgotten about the mystery car. So it'll be a big surprise when they get into the mystery car. Um, you know, we'll see. That's if what that you're really hoping right. for that the readers all forget about the mystery car. It wasn't. It, it wasn't that long ago that you introduced it. But... I, I know. I know. Well, you know, maybe I'm hoping your attention will be elsewhere. There's Pay no attention to the man by the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> the the actual interest in in trains for I mean in in the Magician King in 2011 there is this point where there's this land train that does start sort of going through the sea, um, porpoising through the sea I think as as one person <laughs> described it and I I wondered in this book again there's a train that dives under the water and starts uh, going through was it was there a remnant of of the Silver Arrow back when you were writing The Magician King? Well, that is a deep cut, and I'm really impressed that you asked that question. Um, I actually had never made that connection until this moment. Um, I guess there's something just really, it's, it's just a really compelling image. It's somewhat, I will, I will cop to it somewhat having been stolen from um, what may be my favorite movie of all time, which is Spirited Away by um, Miyazaki. There is a train that goes over the ocean in that book in that movie, um, uh, and I just, I love, I've loved that, I've always loved that scene so much, something about that juxtaposition. Um, and it has become, uh, sort of turned into a motif. And yes, it definitely, it very much comes back uh, in this book. Um, yeah. yeah that's an interesting back. comparison though, because in, in Spirited Away, it does have that sort of elegance of movement, the train in, in the water, which is the same way I think people probably envision what happened in, in the, the Magician King. And I think you created again here, it could just, a train going into the water could be terrible, right? Like it could, it could <laughs> be very clunky in terms of being able to, to maneuver its way. It's not necessarily built for that, yes. that, that process. But, but I mean, that, that's, that's interesting that that mind, do you find when you're writing that, that, you will like a, a scene from a film or or television or another book will spring to mind sometimes in the midst of a thing that you're trying to create in your, on your own terms yes i mean most of all um you know a sort of a certain feeling like i'll think of a book or a movie and i'll think that made me feel a certain way and thought oh that was amazing i love the way that made me feel can i think of a way to make people feel that with this book um in that case though um in this particular case i just sort of i i, I nicked it I nicked it from um <laughs> you from stole it. Music. Yes. I did. I did. From Spirit Away. I asked that because I mean in in your first one of the first published book Warp there that that does keep happening to the main character where he will be thinking about these big thoughts and then have them interrupted by these short scenes of Star Trek or or where sound bites of from movie TV or or books as well, right? And I wondered if this was if this was Lev Grossman as a writer. Well, I'm, I've always, I'm just so fascinated by this way that we live, particularly now, we're just always surrounded by stories all the time. You know, just people are always telling us stories. Um, there are ads always are around us. There's video games and movies and songs that are telling stories. Um, our, our brains are just, they're, they're constantly recycling these stories um, out of which we piece together our own story. Uh, I've always found that very, very fascinating. Uh, and so when I came to write The, Magi the Magicians, you know, in, in some ways, it's a play on Harry Potter. It, it's, a, it's a story about the education of a wizard. And then eventually they go to a magical land, which makes you think of Narnia and a bunch of other magical lands. Um, this idea that stories come from nowhere, um, uh, you know, it's never seemed right to me. Uh, I'm always aware that any story that I, any book that I write is just, is, is, comes out of this sort of wonderful generative mass of stories that we kind of live with every day. Which is interesting. I mean, again, that idea of how you capture the feeling on the train. I wasn't sure how much time you spend the train. I, I did some searching in archives and, and I found an article where you described being on a train where it says between three children and a job at Time magazine, Grossman, this is from six years ago. Uh, Grossman says he writes fiction whenever and wherever he can, sometimes at the Green Grape Annex and occasionally on the G and F trains with a computer in his lap. I mean, does that, has that, has the writing, has where you write and, and being able to write, well, I guess you're probably not doing a lot of writing on a train 
these days during a pandemic, but was are you as likely to be typing away on the train six years later? Well, not as, I, I, it was only I was four years ago, I think, that I quit my day job. Until four years ago, even though I'd written magicians and they were all bestsellers and there was a TV show, I still hung on to this uh, a, 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 a full-time job that I had at Time Magazine. And so I would do a lot of writing on the subway, going to work and then um, coming home from work. Um, it doesn't happen so much um, anymore, but it's true. I've always found it very inspiring. Although I will tell you, I have um, twice in my life spent a night on a train in a sleeper car. Hmm. And I always have loved the idea of being getting to sleep on a train um, in this sort of cozy, luxurious pod that's sort of trundling through the countryside. My experiences with actual sleeper trains have been so horrific. <laughs> I mean, I have never slept a wink on a train, despite having spent two whole nights on trains. Um, there's just, it's, it's just like you're in this tiny cold room, which is being shaken back and forth in this, uh, you know, jackhammer, like two feet under your head of the, of the, of the wheels going up the tracks. It's so horrible. But I, I think that inspired me to make the, um, the sleeper car in the Silver Arrow just like the most sumptuous, comfortable thing you could ever have. I was going to say, reality. when you get to that section of the book, and it describes the closet and the robe and the bed, and there's a little bookshelf that appears and, and <laughs> smelled like clean linen and scented wood. I was like, how much time has Lev Grossman <laughs> ever spent on an actual... This is good. Well, you created I, the idealized sleep. I, I blame T.S. Eliot. You remember in, in uh, uh, Possum's Book of Practical Cats, there's the story about the railway cat, Skimbleshanks. Yeah. And there's a little description of the of his of the little of how cozy it is in the car. And I so I grew up believing that that was the reality, but I was lied to by T. S. Eliot. <laughs> I was so deceived by that man. <laughs> but I think my my sleeper car is descended from that sleeper car, which at no point intersects with reality. Yes, um, you know sometimes you just have to improve on reality. The, I mean, it's interesting you bring up T. S. Eliot in terms of the the um, sound of of cats and creatures that he he the T. S. Eliot could create as well, because there was a point in this book where a wild boar shows up, mm. and you define the sound of a wild boar as ronk, R O N K, and it continues to go ronk 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 ronk. I'm just all it, caps, all caps, yes, all right caps. Here. Could yeah. could you could you give me your wild boar ronk, <laughs> the sound that that you hear when you think of a wild boar? <laughs> You know, I, I'm not, I don't, um, my agents always warn me not to do impressions. Um, <laughs> um, I, it's, just a, it's just a big, it's just a big wrong. I, I'm not going to snort for you. It, it's just a big wrong. Um, and I feel like it's more on an inhale than an, ex an exhale. But, you know, everybody has their own wrong. We're participating. All I'm getting on this chatter is make him do the wrong. That's how everybody is. <laughs> saying it's, it's I can't yeah no I, I don't know if I have that for you but you know <laughs> you'll hear it when you when you re, when you read the book I hope instead instead there is a section there's another voice that I you you create that is um I found extremely compelling considering it's something that doesn't actually talk in the book which is the train itself I mean you chose when the children get on the train they discover they actually communicate with it that it's actually an entity in itself and it creates <laughs> these messages for them, um, and the train has this fantastic personality as well as this, as this entity. Um, I'm going to get you to read some of the the part where they're first communicating with the train. But just first, what when you were trying to determine the personality of the train, which, as we've said, has a very elegant slip through water later on. But what, what, how did you determine the voice of the train? Um, I think some of it comes from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, um, a great children's book. Yeah, oddly enough, written by the same person who created James Bond, uh, and Chitty 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 Bang Bang doesn't talk, but you have a powerful sense of its personality. Um, but when the train, I actually I, I heard this voice very clearly in my head, and I, I wasn't sure whose it was. Um, and at first, I thought, oh, I'm just such a terribly original writer. I've come up with this, you know, pleasant, uh, amusingly sarcastic voice. Um, and then I realized, wait, Kate. I've got an 11 year old daughter and, and that's Kate. And then I've got a son who's younger and that's Tom. The train is the voice of my 16 year old, 16 year old child who is so cold and sarcastic. Um, and, and, and she knows this, so I'm not, I'm not telling tales. Um, uh, the train is really it, based on her and the, just the cold dripping teenage contempt that, that, that she puts out. Um, it's actually not powered by 
fuel or coal or <laughs> firewood as it is in the book. It's actually just content teenage yes it's comfort. very um clean, fuel, burnt, clean fuel, burning uh, fuel yeah <laughs> what um, let's let's hear a little bit of, of the silver sure so the kate and tom uh um these young people who uh, are riding in a, in, a, in a steam train for the first time steam trains are insanely complicated it's not like you're getting into like a cockpit of uh, uh of a car or even like an airplane there's no windshield in the front you're in this little room and it's just this mass of, 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 of pipes and knobs. Nothing's labeled um, in a steam train. Um, uh, and it's, it's so confusing. And so uh, this particular steam train has a little sort of typewriter thing that can talk to you. Um, and uh, uh, it starts talking to Kate and Tom. <clears throat> and it says, the following are instructions for operating this steam engine. I really should have my daughter read this um, to get the tone right. <laughs> uh oh, Kate thought, here we go. More words. Operating a steam engine is really complicated, but don't worry, I'm gonna teach you how to do it. Great. Tom rolled his eyes. Train school. It's not train school, says the train. This is called learning. When done properly, it can actually be quite enjoyable. Though admittedly, it's hardly ever done properly. Tom folded his arms. He looked unconvinced. Look, learning things is incredibly hard and unpleasant. If it wasn't, then everybody would do it all the time. And then everybody would know everything, wouldn't they? Okay, that's actually me. I said that to my children once. Um, Kate shrugged, I guess. Well, you guess right. What you need is a good teacher. Fortunately, I am one. Right, Tom said under his breath. I am right. How can you even be talking? Kate asked, keenly aware that she'd also just asked a fox that exact same question. I, I don't know, I just am. Are you like a giant metal robot or something? I don't know. I mean, aren't you just a robot made out of flesh and bones? If you think about it. I think I'll leave, I'll leave that there since there's no real, no real answer to that question. No, that's, that's amazing. I now have a very clear idea also of exactly how your daughter speaks. So mm -hmm. I think when she watches this video later, I think that that conversation between father and daughter is going to be wonderful, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I feel really confident that she will never watch it because um, everything I do embarrasses her. <laughs> really? Is it at that stage? Like she's got the dad who's embraced as an author year round and now it's, she's just embarrassing. It's a bit of a cliche, but yes, that's where we are. We'll, yeah. we'll get, we'll get through it. I feel uh, 80, 82% confident. Now in terms of the knowledge of, of, you know, the, the science of trains that you get into in, in the book, there's not, I mean, you're, you, there's not tons that we learn here, but you do, there's a point where you make reference to a Belgian engineer, Egi de Valschertz. Am I close with the pronunciation? Close, yeah, close, close, uh, yeah. And somebody who, who had done steam locomotives to go in reverse, allowed them to go in reverse. And then as the narrator, you step in and say, but don't worry, I'm going to leave that part out. You're welcome. <laughs> Which <laughs> is this awesome moment where you intercede and say, don't worry, I'm not going to make you. But is, do you really know about Welshelt? Well, you know, steep trains are a rabbit hole that has no bottom. Um, and on the internet, there's always somebody who knows more about steam trains than you. Yeah. Uh, but I will say that steam trains, I mean, what you just really discover when you start looking into them is, is how preposterously complex, complex they are. They are basically giant iron computers powered by steam that you ride inside. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's unbelievable how sophisticated that technology um, became um, and, you know, really kind of awe-inspiring. Um, and actually that was, one, that was one of the things that really attracted me to them. I liked the idea of, I'm very interested in technology and I, and mm -hmm. I liked the idea of Kate having to kind of master this enormous machine that she was riding inside. It's, it, you, you also make reference to another real life scientist grace hopper and her glasses being very important to, as mm. a discovery for for kate along the way what made you choose grace hopper grace hopper is just one of these people that everybody should know more about grace hopper the world will get better and better the more people know uh, about grace hopper grace hopper was simply one of the world's pioneering computer programmers she was one of the engineers who worked on the earliest electronic computers um when they were really just figuring out what they were and what they were for. And she wrote the first software compiler and 
she was one of these people who was a towering figure in a field where you just know n nobody wanted her there. Nobody encouraged her. She was a woman in this incredibly male dominated field and she just went in and transformed it. Um, and you just imagine the intellect and the, the will of somebody who could do that. Um, and uh, it's not as if she wasn't unsung. She became a rear admiral in the Navy. And um, I think there's an aircraft carrier named after her. She's just one of these, she's one of these people who had a wonderful life. And uh, uh, when I thought about who should be a role model for Kate or really any of my kids, she was the very first person who popped into my head. Who was your Grace Hopper? When you were a kid, who was who would have been the per like that, that? Because there's this fantastic moment where Kate gets to find that object that belonged to Grace Hopper. What would have been that object for you as a kid? Charles, uh, uh, um, my, my idol was was Charles Schultz, uh, who wrote yeah. Peanuts. I wanted to be a cartoonist, um, and then I tried to draw, uh, and it <laughs> turned out to be so hard that I um, immediately abandoned that. Um, but uh, uh, you know, he's probably. Still the person whose glasses I would want most of all. Yeah, or or the pen or that original frame of Lucy and Snoopy or something. That's, that's yeah, amazing. something like that. It's, it's interesting, though, how much of his voice comes through in, in your writing as well. And it's, it's so interesting that he was an idol of yours because there's that same way of talking to kids. I mean, Peanuts was not specifically for children, but but using the voices of kids without talking down to them that comes across in this this writing right like where it's it's got that same somewhat elevated level of discourse that allows you to think yeah kids kids can carry on very fan, fascinating conversation well you know one of my one of my rules for the for writing um silver arrow was my which is my first time ever trying to write for children was that um i'm just going to treat them like adults i'm not going to um talk down to them and i'm not going to dumb things down for them um, because although children don't know everything that adults do, they are exactly as smart as adults. Um, and the other thing about them is that they have the same feelings as adults, which I think is a you know a really powerful insight that Charles Schultz had. Um, his kids, you know, they have these really complicated mixed feelings about everything, including themselves, and they get depressed and they are get angry. You know, they don't. It's not as though children have different emotions from us. They have the same ones, and they struggle with the same things um, that we do. And I think that was something that I, I, I learned from him. Um, and and that, that idea of the insecurity as well. I mean, you, you say, as I mentioned the, at the beginning of the book, Kate is not exactly the, the happiest of campers, but she, she says at least she feels like her problems aren't real problems because she wasn't being beaten or starved or forbidden to go to a royal ball or sent into the woods by an evil step parent. She wished for a zombie apocalypse or an ancient curse or an alien invasion, anything really, so that she could be the hero and survive and triumph against all the odds and save everybody. How much does that reflect who Lev Grossman was as a kid? <laughs> like, did you have that same, that same desire? Oh, so much, so much. Um, and oh, I had, I had, I had, you know, the thing that one of the things that Kate uh, had, which is that I, I wasn't good at anything. Um, mm. You know, I, you know, I know, I, I really, knew, but I know kids, I know kids now, you know, who just they're wonderfully driven. Um, you know, I have, I have a friend whose kid practices the drums five hours a day, and he's incredible, and he sits in with jazz greats, and you know, um, and he's so driven and 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 focused. Um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't good at anything. Um, I, you know, I, I was a small child and a small adult. And uh, I wasn't, I couldn't draw, I couldn't sing, you know, I couldn't juggle. I just, I didn't have one of those talents that w when you're a kid so defines kind of who you are. Um, and as it turned out, the only thing that I was good at or ever became good at was, was writing, but that's not something that you really even figure out until later. In fact, I can remember when I was 17, um, I entered a writing contest uh, sponsored by the National Council of Teachers of English. I remember this so completely. Um, and I, I, I didn't win the, the contest. I was like a semi-finalist or something. But it was the first time I, I felt like I'd ever won a prize for um, something that I was really trying to do. Mm. Um, and it was amazing. I was I, and I thought, I'm good at something. I, 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 <laughs> I actually have a talent. I, and, I, and, it was, and it was it was so that was a very formative moment for me. Um, and I'd like to thank the National Council for Teachers of English for that Absolutely. moment. Absolutely. It was very, very, um, it was a turning but that is That is huge. I mean, that, that idea of, of being recognized for something when you're a kid that is massive. I do not have any sample of your writing from, from that far back. Oh, thank I, God. Yes. <laughs> I do, however, have a reference to 1992, the 
Let's Go, The Budget Guide to Mexico, where Lev Grossman was apparently the editor for Harvard Student Agencies Incorporated. Alan, it's been great talking to you. I've enjoyed the interview a lot. And <laughs> click, click, ding. <laughs> having some internet problems again. Um, yes, that would have been my, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, it's true. I, uh, Harvard undergraduates published a travel guide every year um, and I edited the one to Mexico. Um, uh, and uh, I really heartily recommend Lonely Planet and <laughs> Not, not guy that going. I, I say that I bring it only up because this book involves travel, and there yeah. was an early, early example of Lev Grossman having to capture travel of some kind. Or in, um, uh, that's true. Say. That's a, 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 but Mexico <laughs> remained a real fantasy land for me because I had never been to Mexico um, and only went there last year for the very first time. Um, <clears throat> nor did I speak any Spanish. I was not really strongly qualified to edit that volume. Um, you should have brought your travel guide from 1992 when you actually went to Mexico and see if it, it paid off. <laughs> um, if people have questions for even better than about, like, if you've read the Let's Go 1992 edition, please ask what, no. If you have questions for Lev about um, the magicians or the sombrero or writing for these books, you can uh, use the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen, ask your questions uh, and send them that way. We did get a question in from David who says, you have a history of talking animals with the magicians and talking rabbits. Why rabbits on the magicians? And what is your fascination with talking animals? Now, I, I can't really take credit for the rabbits on the TV show. Um, I was definitely in, heavily involved with the TV show, but the rabbits was, I don't know whose idea the rabbits were, um, but I've always loved talking animals. And I can tell you where, um, it, part of it came from reading T.H. White and the, um, and sort of so, and part of it came from reading um, one of the H Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books by mm -hmm. Douglas Adams. I don't know if you know these books, but they're probably the funniest books that have ever been written by anybody. Um, and in one of them, there's a little, sort of a little throwaway joke where the uh, uh, the hero, um, it's sort of the end of the book, and he learns to speak the language of birds, um, which is this sort of wonderful, fantastical idea. Um, and he immediately regrets it because all the birds ever talk about are um, seeds and wind conditions and nothing else and they're just so boring um and now he has to listen to birds you know saying this boring stuff all day long and i remember thinking uh, i thought it was funny but i also think that's so true that is what they would talk about <laughs> and it just it made me very interested in the idea of writing from the point of view of uh an animal and really thinking about what their lives are like and what their concerns would be which are not the concerns necessarily um of human beings. I also like animals because they're very unselfconscious. Yeah. They, um, uh, they have this wonderful quality of presence and focus to them. And they, if they could talk, they would say what they meant and mean what they say. Uh, and they have very strong personalities that they're not embarrassed about. Uh, and in that sense, they're a real gift to a writer because they, you know, they sort of put themselves out there in this great way. It's interesting. I mean, you you use almost there's a section where the porcupine says about the um, bunnies and and mice that they would only talk about the seeds and and what yeah. they eat as well. That's <laughs> so much robbery happening in this literary career. I'm just kidding, but th there is a beautiful passage also where the fishing cat talks about how animals don't have regrets, how they are focused in the moment as well, which is something I don't. I, I hadn't really pondered before reading this book in terms of an animals. What well, they said, of course, they get sad. I don't have that section in front of me right now, but they, they, of course, we get sad, but we don't regret things the same way that humans do. Yeah, animals are really wise in that way. Um, in that full, you know, I, I uh, uh, it's an overused word, but they have that mindfulness that um, uh, we as humans can only aspire to. I don't think that animals, you know, f fantasize all the time about what their lives would really be like, you know, if things were different or if they'd, you know, if they'd, if they'd run off with, you know, so-and-so like 10 years ago, I think they're really <laughs> focused on reality. It's a different book really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I've, I've said too much. Um, <laughs> uh, they, um, they're really focused on reality. They're really in the moment. Um, they don't sit around torturing themselves with ridiculous fantasy about, fantasies about what might have been. Um, I really think that they face up to reality in this very wise, very strong way. And when I thought about what lessons Kate could learn from talking to animals, that was the first one that came to me. Because we as humans, I think, 
it is a lifelong struggle to face up to our fears and to and to and, and to reality what's really going on and animals kind of do that naturally yeah and it's just one of those great things that 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 um that i aspire to also david did also ask what animal would you be if you were an animal mm. this is an important question mm. um uh uh unrelated to reality but i i still <laughs> i still feel it's important um I don't think one could really turn away from 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 the uh, the lure of flight if one was an animal. Yeah. Um, so so uh, you know, a heron I, from this book. Uh, <laughs> herons, um, you know, herons are really. Yeah, I'll be a heron. I'd, I'd be a heron. I think that would be a great thing to be to be a heron. The one who says, "If we all go over this cliff, I'll fly away, but I'll remember you fondly." To all yeah. the other people in the book, which really like makes you. feel you got it. You really bet on the heron in that scenario. So, um, um, yeah. Now, uh, Anne, I believe it's Anne, uh, says a delightful interview. So what age is the book suitable for? And th this is an interesting question, actually, because um, I, I don't know whether, do you have that in mind? Do you have those age brackets in mind when you're writing? Well, you know, the sort of guide rails of the book were, were, were was really sort of, Roll Dahl, so Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, uh, Danny Champion of the World. Um, mm -hmm. I sort of, tr I tried not to use words that Roll Dahl would not have used. Um, and so I think that, you know, uh, my son got, definitely got into it. He's seven. I don't think um, uh, any younger, uh, you know, you'd really follow um, uh, what was going on. I sort of feel like seven and up. If, if, if as an adult, you're capable of enjoying Roll Dahl as I am, um, you might get something out of it, but I would say seven is the it's the youngest. It's not that it has anything scary in it, um, really at all. Um, but uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of feelings in it. Um, you'd probably have to be older than that. The wild boar, the ronk ronk, was a little bit scary. It was, I wasn't. I wasn't <laughs> I sure. So. I hope it was a little bit scary. I was going to pan out. But as, as we talked about earlier today, the, on the, during the the all in a day interview, um, a lot of times when there were things that could have been scary they're often deflated by humor quickly, or you have the feeling of like, okay, I think this is probably going to be okay. And you even say at one point, years later, Kate would think back on this time uh, when she was, I think you make the comparison to champagne or something when uh, much yeah. later experiences that she was going to have growing up that lets us know nothing bad's going to happen to Kate. Like she, we know she's going to make it through to the end of this. And, and there's, a, there's going to be a, if not a happy ending necessarily there's going to be a, a future is that different from when you're writing for for the adult crew in terms of assuring people that it's going to be okay um that is actually that is that is a real difference between between children and adults as readers um uh with with adults um you want to um feel as though you as the author are a credible threat to any of the characters in the book and no one is guaranteed to, to make it through. Um, uh, I feel like that kind of uncertainty is it's actually, it's a real characteristic of adult fiction, fiction as opposed to children's fiction. I like to think that there is a moment in the silver era when it is very much touch and go. Um, and it does seem as though it's curtains for our heroine. Uh, I wouldn't, I won't give it away. Um, but you might forget in that moment that we know that she will survive. Um, and prosper and drink champagne later in life. <laughs> but, but I mean, what's interesting about it is even without the life or death question, there's such tension throughout, right? Like you all, there is a sense of, okay, maybe she's going to be fine later on, but we don't know how it's all going to work out for, for, for everybody else. And certainly we don't know in real life, the fate of the world either. Like these are, these are uh, scarier questions about what, what might happen to any of the characters or any of the species along the way. And, the places that you're you're comfortable going with that I found really interesting. Even the scene where they become trees for extended periods of of time, um, it's beautifully described. This idea of of you actually sort of becoming one with a forest and going there, which I think for a lot of kids, again, is is not only that element of of sort of this dream idea of of feeling what it would be like to be a tree, but there's a bigger point that you're making there in understanding. The world around us too. Yeah, it's one of those things that don't, things that, that that only books can do. Um, I don't think that any you know, because books have that ability to um, do things that are impossible 
uh, in the real in real life and also to go inside your head and really inhabit your emotions I feel like that was one of those moments where I was like, yeah, this is a very booky moment. I don't feel like you could really do this in another medium. Um, don't um, tell the agents that. Don't say that. You never... <laughs> have you learned nothing? <laughs> um, uh, well, it's just one of those... It's, it, it's a bit that I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of. Um, there's a moment yeah. in The Magicians where uh, the characters all turn into geese. Um, mm -hmm which actually happens in um, uh, The Sword and the Stone as well. Um, but people often say, uh, that's, that's, that's my favorite bit. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's one of my favorite bits when they turn into trees. Um, people turning into other things, I feel like that's another motif that, that um, you know, uh, I am not, I'm not trying to get away from. Um, I keep coming back to it. And the tree would be perhaps another example where I'm picturing you like stretching out in the apartment, <laughs> trying to figure out, okay, how far would my feet have to go to become this root but but i mean it does also play with time because we're not sure at the end of that passage how much time has actually passed were they really trees was she just about like what the, what that actual reality was and i wondered for for you how much that mapping in in a story that has that magical element to it how much the mapping of time is important or is there greater freedom with that Oh, magic is the greatest is the greatest of all cheats where that's concerned. Um, time becomes very elastic, uh, yeah. and um, you know, and even uh, uh, and uh, it can stretch and be compressed. Um, it's one of those things I don't trouble myself with too <laughs> too much yeah. um, because, uh, well, um, there's, there are good reasons why why I like to write fantasy. <laughs> I don't have to play by the rules of, a, of an actual yeah, map. Some of the rules. Map I, think, I, pick and, I really pick and choose which rules, you know. Yeah. But the role of, of that sensory writing to you, I mean, have, have you found as you've continued writing, has that played a, in terms of being able to describe that, even just that idea of becoming a tree, do you feel you, you can write that passage differently than you could have, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's certainly something... When I was uh, um, in college and then in graduate school, I, I studied, um, I didn't study fantasy literature. I studied um, modernism. I studied Joyce and Hemingway and Virginia Woolf, you know, who were these incredibly great detailed describers of reality and of, of bodily experience. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, Joyce is the first person I can ever really remember describing somebody going to the bathroom or Virginia Woolf described somebody falling asleep and then going into a dream. You know, she, they really, they just, they were so amazing. And if there's something that marks out my fantasy writing as distinctive, I feel like it's, it's, it's what I learned from those very literary, you know, classical writers um, and kind of bring to the fantasy genre. Uh, and it's, I especially try to bring it to those moments of, of really sort of out there magical stuff to f make it, keep it grounded and, and keep it feeling real is i know everybody's pondering this considering the, the adaptation of the magicians but does it affect when you're writing now just that little bit somewhere in the mind thinking hmm, i could see this as a film i could see this as a tv series is that does that ever weigh on you at all when you're writing this that weighted that's not the right word but 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 does it do you, are you ever thinking more cinematically as a result i don't think so I don't think so. I, it's it's. Um, uh, uh, I think it would be a it would be a fool's errand to try to chase that kind of that kind of stuff. I feel like books. There's a reason why books. You know, they're obviously books. They don't sell the most copies. They're not. They're uh, the, the, you know people. Many more people saw the magicians TV show than have read the books. Um, uh, hmm. But I think the reason books are so powerful and that they so often set the agenda for movies and TV um, um, is that, you know, there's just so much themselves. And then um, I'll let I'll let other people worry about putting them on screen. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I think about it that much, really. Um, I can remember writing things uh, in The Magicians that were so expensive to do. And I later thought, ooh, I could have saved a lot, a lot of money if I didn't put that scene in Antarctica. Uh, I could have put it in <laughs> um, uh, New Mexico and said it would have been more affordable. Um, but, you know, you can't, um, I feel like you can't uh, let your imagination be shackled by that stuff. It's this, honestly, this is a, such a joy to read and I, it doesn't need any kind of adaptation later on. I, I thank you for writing it. Thanks for taking part in this tonight, love. This has been a total treat to, to chat with you about the book. This is a huge treat for me too.
Uh, to everybody who's been with us, uh, the next Children and Teens author is going to be with us on November 16th. Uh, Kenneth Obel is going to be part of this. You can uh, be part of that then. And a uh, th huge thank you to Ottawa Public Library and Ottawa International Writers Festival at Library and Archives Canada for uh, having us here tonight. Didn't even get around to asking him about the 1996 uh, quote in an article where he was talking about the dancing baby and Ally McBeal, but that will be our next chat with Lev Grossman. <laughs> wait for it. It's going to be the entire conversation next time. Just wait and see. Lev Grossman, in all seriousness, thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you, Alan. Next event next week, we'll be talking about the book. I won't be, but we, but somebody will be on here talking about uh, the book Nerve by Ava Holland. Thanks for being with us tonight. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.